knew for certain where Carol was and what had happened to her. You just hope and pray. Please don't let them find her there. This was an investigation that was upside down. It was the reverse of normal investigations. No normally, you have a victim who you know who the victim is, and you don't know who the offender is. But this time, we had an offender, and we didn't know who the victims were. Every year in this country, more than 200,000 people go missing. Most come home in a few days. Around 3,000 are never seen again. One winter's Thursday in 1994, a middle-aged married couple walked their dogs as usual in Gloucester Park. For Fred and Rose West, this was to be their last evening of freedom together. Just two minutes walk away, Policemen had arrived with a search warrant and begun to dig up their garden patio, looking for a missing 16-year-old girl. Heather West had vanished shortly after she left school. Nobody had seen her in seven years. The, the sort of checks that we could carry out would normally reveal that someone's visiting a doctor, um, signing on um, the DSS, or benefit somewhere. There was nothing like that with Heather. Then, of course, there was uh, the bit of history about the Wests, which tended you to, to think that there may be something uh, not quite right. We'd already been involved with the family uh, as we'd started an investigation in 1992 into allegations of, of rape on the young West children by both Rose and Fred. This investigation failed simply because the the, the witnesses, the, the children, did not want to give evidence in the case, so, so therefore that we could not continue with the, the prosecution. Though the case collapsed, the police kept an open file, and the five youngest children were all taken into care. The children who were in care had been talking about Heather being buried under the patio, and things like three stones up and two stones out were said, um, and we felt we couldn't ignore that any longer. I, I seem to recall at the time that, that there was a, a, a theme on Brookside about someone being buried under a patio, and it was always in the back of, back of your mind. The police knocked on the door on the 24th of February, 1994. I recall now, I think we got a bit of swearing from Mrs West um, and denials. Uh, we told her what we intended to do to execute the warrant and what we intended to excavate the garden. Her whole body seemed to sag slightly, and uh, she paled a little bit uh, and looked away. Uh, and I got the impression then that there may have well have been something in the garden that she was not happy about and that she wouldn't want us to find. So both of them came up with explanations that Heather had gone off um, in a mini car with, with a lesbian, uh, that she was alive and well and living in Western Supermare. Uh, there was a suggestion that she'd gone off to Birmingham and was associating with people there. And, and in fact, I think Fred West on one occasion said that he had bumped into to Heather in the street and uh, he just checked with her that she was OK, and, and that was about the extent of it. And so neither were arrested. We still had insufficient evidence to actually arrest them for, for any offence. And so that they were allowed to actually spend their last night together at 25 Cromwell Street. His last night of freedom. Her last night with her husband of 22 years. It was still just a single missing person case when next morning, Gloucester detectives set to work. Detective Constable Darren Law had only been in the CID for three months. We went to the address and Fred answered the door. Uh, he invited us in. We told him what we, you know, we need some information with regards to some uh, some of Rose's relatives, and we were invited into what I believe to be the living room in the address. 
Um, he called Rose in and informed her what we wanted, and Rose went absolutely mad. Um, really lost her temper, became quite a, a, aggressive and abusive uh, towards us at the time, which really, for somebody like myself who'd just come into the inquiry at that time, I thought, well, you know, this is really strange. Um, Fred basically said, Rose, come with me, and he invited her out of the room. They both left the room, leaving myself and WDC Hazel Savage sort of stood in the room, wondering really what's going on at that point. After a short time, Fred came back and uh, basically said something along the lines of, you better take me to the police station. Um, I have killed Heather, but you're digging in the wrong place. Um, so we've become recently aware that she's been uh, a missing person. Our information leads us to believe that there is a possibility, and I wouldn't put any higher than that, that Heather West could be buried in the garden. And so we, accordingly, we, we have to dig it up to, to try and find whether that might be right or not. Shortly after lunch, the police diggers found a bone, a single human thigh bone, or femur. But when they looked for the matching bone, they found two. Three thigh bones, three femurs, more than one body, more than just one missing girl. Three femurs, three leg bones, what is going on? This was subsequently put to Fred during an interview, uh, and he went on to then admit that there was another another um, lady buried down in the, in the garden at Cromwell Street. By that day's end, Fred West had told the police there were three bodies in his back garden. Detective Superintendent John Bennett now took charge, a senior investigating officer. When I first realised that there were three victims in the garden and each of them were girls, I started to look back upon previous cases that had happened in Gloucestershire where girls had gone missing. Cases like Lucy Partington, a 21-year-old university student unseen since 1973. Linda Goff, 19, a fireman's daughter who'd vanished the same year. And Mary Bastone, a 15-year-old waitress missing since 1968. A massive police hunt was launched for Mary, who vanished from a bus stop on a dark winter's night almost 35 years ago. John Bennett was among the hundreds of officers assigned to her case. He went into the water at Gloucester Docks looking for her. He was then a 22-year-old detective constable and a member of the police diving squad. Everyone in Gloucestershire had some involvement in it in some way. She had literally disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, it was an out of character. Uh, clearly, to everyone, something sinister must have happened. She must have been abducted. And everyone was hoping that uh, she was going to be found safe and well somewhere. Nothing that connected with Mary's disappearance was found. And of course, there was no evidence of Mary whatsoever. Her case was never closed, and John Bennett never forgot her. By 1994, he'd been 30 years a policeman. His prisoner, almost 30 years a killer. In an interview room at Gloucester Police Station, Darren Law got a name for one of the dead girls. He basically um, said that uh, it was uh, Shirley Robinson, who, um, who was also buried in there, and a, a female whose name he didn't know, who he described as Shirley's mate. Uh, and he referred to her as Shirley's mate through the, the in subsequent interviews that we had with regard to her. When the name Shirley Robinson first came into the investigation, we looked to see whether Shirley Robinson was a missing person. That was within the local records and with what national records existed at the time. We could find no trace of a missing person by the name of Shirley Robinson anywhere. Shirley Robinson had been dead for 16 years, and in all that time, nobody had ever reported her as missing. On day five of the dig, they identified her. 18 years old, from Wolverhampton, 
a lodger in the West household. Shirley was eight months pregnant at the time of her death. The baby was Fred West's. So the 53-year-old man in the police cell had killed not only his daughter, but his young lover and their unborn child. In an interview situation, Fred West came across as a very plausible, very likeable individual. He would talk for Britain. He was very friendly. He was very chatty. And the real horror and enormity of what he was actually doing and what he was involved in, if you actually sat across a table and you know were discussing these things with him, it was very, very difficult to, to accept and to believe. He was someone that always had a dirty joke to tell. He was someone who was very... Uh, much a family man, an amiable uh, individual, someone that uh, you could have a conversation with, um, someone that was totally disarming, a likeable rogue. Neighbours were amazed when the popular local builder was charged with the murders of Heather, Shirley and her still unidentified mate, a girl with no name. All over Britain, families were watching. Families with reason to fear the worst. I was at work and I looked at a newspaper and it was talking about three bodies that had been unearthed in, at 25, in the garden of 25 Cromwell Street in Gloucester. And my immediate response, completely instinctive, was, is this something to do with Lucy? Marion Partington's sister Lucy had now been missing for 20 years. At Christmas 1973, the two young women were at home with their mother near Cheltenham. Lucy was 21, a university student and a recent convert to Catholicism. She went into town to see a friend. Around 10 o'clock, she was seen walking to the bus stop. But Lucy Partington never caught that bus home. And she was never seen again. I think all of us felt this terrible fear because Lucy wasn't the kind of person that would have just gone off without telling us and she was a very responsible person. And I think we all felt that something awful might have happened. New Year, 1974. Six years after the failed hunt for Mary Bastholm. Another massive search for another missing Gloucestershire girl. And another diving job for John Bennett. This time he dived the lake in the Cheltenham Park close to the bus stop from which Lucy should have found her way home. When we knew that there were three victims uh, in the garden of Cromwell Street, to myself, I had to think that Lucy Partington could have been one of them. March the 4th, 1994, would have been Lucy's 42nd birthday. On that day, Fred West dictated a note. His solicitor took it to John Bennett. He was clearly shocked about something, and he had this piece of paper in his hand, and he asked me whether I would like to sit down before I read it. The note said, uh, I, Frederick West, authorise my solicitor to notify Superintendent Bennett that I wish to admit to an approx nine further killings, signed Fred West. It was very difficult to come to terms with what we were faced with in those few moments. I often say that you only often get one chance in investigations and in what you're doing, and so you have to grasp that and you have to take that. And it's, when you fail, then 
you fail forever. Fred West began to tell his terrible story. For me, personally, it was almost a surreal moment because it, you're there, you're sat face to face with a, with a man who, who is telling you how he has killed, you know, a lot of women, basically. He murdered and, and killed a lot of women. I do actually recall driving home in my car on that evening after those interviews and after all that information had, uh, had come out into the, into the room and thinking, I just cannot believe this is going on. You know, in Gloucester, of all places, I just can't believe this is happening. Every year in Britain, 10,000 people go missing and stay missing. One in three of them are never seen again. Marion Partington endured 20 years of waiting to discover what had happened to her lost sister. The thing that was the most difficult for me was this feeling that we were all going to die and we were never going to know what had happened to Lucy and that was just intolerable and it wasn't getting better, it was getting worse. Lucy was four years younger than me so she had her own set of friends and I was definitely the big bossy older sister. It was the late 60s, early 70s, and I definitely was exploring flower power and living with my boyfriend and hitchhiking everywhere, and Lucy was becoming more and more serious and not wanting to explore the fashions and sticking to her duffel coat and, and her desert boots. My mind was always scanning and obsessively going over details of the last time we spent together and imagining different scenarios, like had she committed suicide, had she joined a nunnery, and just the, the whole business of had she been murdered, which was the most obvious thing, was something that I find it very hard to even begin to think about. In Gloucester, police officers took Fred West back to Cromwell Street, under cover of darkness. It was decided to take Fred to Cromwell Street so that he could show where he'd buried the remains of some of these women. We went there, I think maybe one or two o'clock in the morning, certainly very late at night, when there was no one around because we didn't want to be seen by the media and we didn't want a circus. We gave Fred a spray can and he sprayed points on the floor of the cellar where he'd buried various young women. It all seemed a bit bizarre in the middle of the night, Fred showing us where remains of people were. Police had told the Partingtons they'd get in touch when there was any news. This was all happening very close to Lucy's birthday, which is March the 4th, and so I usually spent Lucy's birthday with my mum. So I'd taken some knitting with me and I'd taken lots of, of um, marmalade, oranges, and I thought, I'm going to do lots of practical things and I'm going to make marmalade and knit and spend the day with my mum and, and we'll talk about Lucy and remember Lucy and then I'll come back the next day because by that time it felt as if oh well probably isn't anything to do with her and um but the whole day I was just we all felt this kind of strange energy of anticipation and anxiety police began to dig inside the house in the cellar under tons of concrete they began to find the dismembered bodies of six more young women. Fred West had been talking to them and he told them that one of them was called Lucy. Everything had already gone into slow motion by this time. This was it. This was what we'd been waiting for.
When the small boxes of human remains made their pathetic final exit from Cromwell Street, there were still very few clues to who most of them had been in life. The man in charge of the investigation at 25 Cromwell Street in Gloucester appealed today to thousands of missing people to come forward so that they can be ruled out of the inquiry. Detective Superintendent John Bennett was speaking after Frederick West was charged with the murder of another five women. He's already charged with murdering three, including his daughter, Helen. The problems that faced us were initially one of identification. Who were these victims? Only in such times as a plane crash or a train crash or a national disaster would ever anyone need to have this type of volume of identification problem. Because of the massive worldwide coverage on the media, parents were obviously ringing up on a regular basis saying, well, our daughter went missing all those years ago. Do you think she's involved? Or is she one of the victims? And those had to be checked out. Among those missing at the time was a Londoner last seen at Harrow on the Hill tube station 25 years ago. Her sister, Jay Harold, put her on a train as a teenager and never saw her again. Her name was Jill Barnard. She was 19 years old. I had visions of Jill being one of this number of young girls who'd been murdered and it made me feel sick, but then I would think the chances of it are remote. You, you try and be logical about it. Think, well, no. I mean, there's a there's a lot of people in in this country. Why, Jill? As I waved to her, I turned to my mother, and I've just got this. Funny feeling. I, I said, I, Mum, I don't think I'm ever going to see Jill again. The sisters had arranged to meet in the same place the next day. I turned up on the Monday, um, aware that the clocks had changed, and uh, waited for her. Um, I waited up to eight hours. It's very unlike her to not turn up. Just kept scanning faces and just expecting her to come through the barrier at any moment. But I did keep thinking about that funny feeling I had when I said goodbye. The very next day, I started going to London with Jill's photograph, asking uh, buskers, um, people who were begging, just anybody who, who seemed to be standing around. And people were very helpful, um, but nobody had seen her. For Jay Harold, it was the start of 25 years of searching. She appealed for help to another pair of sisters. Janet Newman and Mary Asprey had recently set up a new charity to help missing people and their families, starting out with just each other and one phone line out of Janet's little flat. I'd really like to say to you, we were planned it all and we knew exactly what we were doing. Well, we didn't. I don't know what I thought really when we very first started, what was gonna happen? I certainly didn't think we were gonna find people. We worked seven days a week. <clears throat> every day, 24 hours a day, and that was the two of us. So, you know, but we learned so much. And we had very few cases, <clears throat> obviously. Yeah. We had, when we first started here, maybe one case a day, then really. Gradually built up and gradually, that's when we had to move, because it was then becoming, we could see that it was going to be big. Princess Diana today visited the Missing Persons Bureau, which is run by a team of volunteers from an office in Sheen. She met through the founders of... By the time the West case broke, their office in London had recorded thousands of inquiries from worried relatives and friends of missing people. 
Hello, National Missing Persons Helpline. Can I help you? They'd logged every call. And as they uncovered the shocking scale of family distress, they were also collecting a unique database of missing people. Information which would transform the investigation into the Cromwell Street murders. The sisters went off to Gloucester to see if they could help. Before this action came through, I'd never heard of the National Missing Persons Helpline. And I needed that type of information. I needed information that told us uh, who was missing. From whatever source it came from, I didn't mind where it came from. I needed that information. John Bennett asked us in the first place to go and search our database to see how many missing people we had in the immediate area of Gloucester. We did that. We came up with 79 names which we sent to the Gloucester police. Gloucester came back, they'd searched their database, they only had 12. I was totally amazed. I couldn't understand how that could be. And it took uh, some lengthy conversation and understanding to appreciate why that was. The reason was that the police service uh, and Gloucestershire was no different to anywhere else, recorded people that they considered to be vulnerable, whilst the Missing Persons Helpline recorded anyone that was reported missing to them. To the police, nobody counts as vulnerable who's over the age of 18 and in good health. In total, the sisters were able to hand over 390 names of missing girls names mostly new to the police. In the Gloucester incident room, DC Nick Churchill began to track the lost girls down. Making a cold call to, um, to a person that you think is a missing person um, is like delivering the worst message that you can ever deliver. You do not know how they are going to react. On the Matrix system, we know... I was calling these people um, out of the blue, 20 years on since that they'd left this area and or left anywhere and started a new life um, but there's there was no straightforward easy way of doing this and it was a it was a vertical learning curve for me as well one of the first names the helpline gave him was carol white she'd had a local gloucestershire childhood with her mother shirley yeah, i couldn't put a finger on a definite date that carol went missing because for a long time here she wasn't missing she'd just gone off and she would be back you know it might sound mad but that that's how things are she did it before she do it again she would come back you know so, it's only as the years pass that she's not coming back you know and then after a little while you think well why isn't she coming back, you know? And that's when you start to think, well, perhaps she's not alive anymore. Eh? Missing, believed dead, for 18 years. And then a phone call from Gloucester Police, right in the middle of the West case. I can remember phoning Mrs. White. Now, this would have been very early in the inquiry, one of the first calls that I made, or, or well into it. And I was still should we say, learning my trade, if that's the best way of putting it. Um, and I made the mistake, if you could call it a mistake, of letting Mrs White know that I'd found her daughter, but without clarifying with her daughter that she really wanted to get back in contact with her parents. She was alive, she was well, she was working, and things were all right with it. Like, Lovely, you know, could I have her address? And they said, well, no, they couldn't give me the address, but they could suggested I get in touch with the uh, missing persons people. The missing persons helpline forwarded a letter from Mrs White to her daughter, who that summer got on a train from London to be reunited with her mother after 18 years. I was very nervous to start with. I hadn't seen her for at least 18 years. I wasn't even sure whether I'd recognise her. And there was all these people kept coming and coming, and there was no sign of anybody that even looked like her. I started to think she changed her mind, you know, and uh, then I saw this tall blonde, and she still had her long shoulder length hair, you know, and 
I just recognized her and it was lovely. Their relationship hasn't always been easy since then, though Mrs. White and her lost daughter do still keep in touch. As the West case detectives were to discover, truly happy reunions in missing persons cases are rare. Without a shadow of a doubt, it, it wasn't the, uh, the lovely fairy tale ending that, you know, straight away that everyone's going to get back together and it's all going to be sort of hugs and kisses. It really, most of the time, it was a bit the other way that I was opening wounds on both sides. It is not an offence to run away, to go missing. And we've got to realise that they're having found them, we've got to let them go on with their life. One hundred and thirty-nine families learnt their daughters were still alive as a direct result of Nick Churchill's collaboration with the Missing Persons Helpline. He worked alongside DC Mark Grimshaw, the force analyst, who had to invent new ways to organise and display a vast flow of information. Uh, I was told, come in, produce a few charts, and you'll be out of here in a week. Didn't quite go like that. Every effort was directed to restoring the names and faces to the anonymous dead of Cromwell Street. And that meant satisfying one man, the forensic dentist, Professor David Whittaker. He already had the victim's skulls. He needed more. I needed good photographs, straight on face, lots of teeth showing, big smile, and as much detail in the teeth as I could get. That's all I needed, really. The professor had already formally identified Heather West and Shirley Robinson. Now he confirmed everyone's fears when he named victim number three. She was Lucy Partington. Fred and Rose West were known as relaxed landlords, sexually free and easy, tolerant of drugs, always ready for a chat. Their house became a magnet for young people looking for bedsits. A lot of people had passed through that address, uh, lodged there, been visitors there, uh, and uh, had moved on. Uh, um, the type of people who were transient population, the whole area was full of bedsits in any event, and 25 Cromwell Street had, had been like an open house for people. There were a variety of, uh, of girls that had passed through there. Some had lodged with him, some that he'd employed for babysitters or, or, or nannies, and others he met casually. Now they were unknown females, lost girls. Fred West said he didn't know their names. He called them Shirley's mate, the Worcester girl. There was a foreign girl. He thought she might be Dutch. Within the accounts that he gave, it was a maze of information. And that you had to pick out the pieces that you hadn't heard before just to see whether they actually were true. Sometimes these little snippets were right. Uh, and they built up a picture either of the victim or the circumstances. They had to work from just the odd tiny clue. Like the firework burn Fred mentioned the Worcester girl had on her hand. In the interview, Fred uh, described, when he, when he described the Worcester girl, um, one thing again that sticks out in my memory on that is he said that she had a, a distinctive firework burn to her hand. Didn't know how she'd got it or anything like that. Five days after bonfire night in 1973, a Worcester woman had reported her granddaughter missing. Caroline Cooper was a rebellious 15-year-old, a biker girl living in care, last seen getting on a bus after going to the pictures. Matching Carol's smudgy photo booth snap to her skull, Professor David Whitaker was able to identify her. I start with a kind of blank piece of paper, like, like writing a detective novel. 
And, and the reason why I get asked to do this as a, as a dentist is because people's teeth actually contain more information about who they are and, and what their background is and what their lifestyle has been than any other part of the body. The scientific problem was that all the remains were so similar. All female, all young. And after 20 years, there were few dental records to help him tell them apart. So I was asking the police to find photographs of any of these missing girls. Because my problem was to eventually sort of weld these pictures together electronically with the skull. To gather photos, the police needed names. At the National Missing Persons Helpline in London, the sisters and their staff were still trawling painstakingly through their records. On one of their thousands of record cards, Mary found notes she had once made of a single phone call from someone who had then put the phone down on her. This card came out with just the name just Gloucester, date of birth, and we were able to help John Bennett and his team by giving them that really scant detail. Looking back now, we realize how efficient we were then to actually keep that card with just that information on. Their information named the 18-year-old daughter of an American serviceman. She'd failed to turn up to babysit for a friend in 1975. Her name was Juanita Mott. It clicked with this skull. It just went... It, when the pictures began to merge together, you suddenly know that's it because everything fits. The teeth fit, the eyes fit, the shape of the face fits. Juanita Mott was not the only name the sisters found in their files. They also helped to solve the mystery of the girl Fred called Shirley's mate. It turned out she'd never met Shirley. She was a 16-year-old runaway who had been living in the West household, helping to look after the children. Her name was Alison Chambers. In a letter to her parents, she described her unnamed employers as a very homely family, happy and relaxed. Linda Goff, the 19-year-old fireman's daughter, had also been a lodger at Cromwell Street. Her mother went round there soon after she disappeared. Rose West, then also only 19, came to the door wearing Linda's slippers. Six weeks into the case, there were still two victims who could not be identified. The pressure on John Bennett's team was intense. Two left two unknown girls, and very few clues. Fred was given some sort of clues about who these people may be. You know, one he would refer to a, a, as, as someone he called Chula, uh, and he said he was a Dutch girl. The Dutch girl, he referred to her as the Dutch girl, and he would say things like she wasn't, she wasn't German, she wasn't French, but she had this accent. I was leaving the incident room uh, late, late-ish one night, and there was only myself and John Bennett left in the room. Um, John Bennett was working in his office, and as I was leaving, I popped in to say goodnight. And he was sat looking at uh, one particular chart which was stuck up on the wall, which was, in fact, uh, a floor plan of 25 Cromwell Street. It was almost embarrassing that I hadn't seen it before because it was just actually staring me in the face every day. He knew who lay buried either side of the so-called Dutch girl knew only a year separated the dates they went missing. He wondered, what if Fred West had a system? What if he'd laid out his circle of graves chronologically, clockwise? If that hypothesis was right, it reduced the number down from over 130 possibles to probably five. Of those, one had been reported missing in uh, the Metropolitan Police area, and they had 
a full missing persons report which included dental records. And I was still working on the skull at that stage when I can remember getting the phone call, we've located a dentist in Switzerland, a lady dentist, and better than that, she still got some dental records for a girl that's missing and is called Siegenthaler. Teresa Siegenthaler was 21, a university student. Swiss, not Dutch. Last seen 20 years earlier, setting off for an Easter holiday in Ireland. We'd identified all the sets of human remains apart from one. I was sat at the home's computer, um, which we had within the incident room one evening, trying to see if there was anything else that we could find in relation to the one that we hadn't identified. We thought that it was a girl named Shirley Hubbard. The main problem was that there were seemed to be very few photographs of her, and one day I looked on the, the computer system and seeing that we'd made some inquiries about trying to find more information about Shirley and that she'd been a bridesmaid at a wedding sometime previously. Well, I thought, well, if, if she was a bridesmaid, there have got to be photographs of the wedding. And in fact, an excellent photograph which showed her smiling uh, and quite clearly showed her teeth. Uh, and this was an absolute godsend as far as Professor Whitaker is concerned. And from that, he was able to identify positively that it was Shirley. Shirley Hubbard was 15 years old when she left her foster parents' house, taking all her clothes with her. She was put on a bus by her boyfriend and never seen again. Um, Shirley Hubbard was, I don't know why, but out of all the victims, the one that affected me the most. Um, picture of a little girl peeking behind a, a tree um, was the one that actually got to me. Nine lost girls, nameless and faceless, for 20 years. Nine families grieving for nine young victims of the most horrible sexual cruelty. I think of the time of not knowing the 20 years, a bit like carrying round an, an iceberg, you know, something gets frozen. And so this was the thaw in a way. Finding out what happened to her was actually beyond our worst imaginings. So. I could see there was a lot of pain ahead and a lot of questions, um, but there was the opportunity to lay Lucy to rest and pay tribute to her life and reclaim her as my sister. So there was a lot of work to do when we found out, but at least there was something to work with and it wasn't just going to be left just frozen and stuck and unresolved, which was much worse to me. For many more families, the successful identification of the Cromwell Street victims brought no resolution. I was relieved when I discovered that Jill wasn't one of these young girls found at Cromwell Street. And it put my mind at rest that way, but on the other hand, I had hopes that there would be some kind of resolution to all of this, and there wasn't. My memories of Jill are fading now, very slightly. Um, I don't want them to. I, I want to hang on to them. I want to see her fresh in my in my mind. But there. With time, they are fading. For the police, solving the mystery of the identities of the Cromwell Street victims was only the beginning. Still no clues to the fate of Mary Bastholm, 
who, like four of the dead girls, vanished trying to catch a bus. And where was Fred's missing first wife? Her eight-year-old daughter? Her friend, the teenager who Fred said was an angel? Was Fred West telling the truth when he told one survivor he had killed many more girls? And if so, where were they buried? And what about his wife, who came to the door wearing a dead girl's slippers? Was Rose West just another innocent victim? Fred has always said Rose had nothing to do with it. Right? Rose says she didn't know anything about any of it. It was so obvious that his purpose was to protect her. I truly believe that many of these girls who disappeared uh, and were subsequently found in Cromwell Street were actually taken for Rose's benefit as opposed to Fred's. The final part of Lost Girls will be next Thursday at 9. If you're grieving for someone or would like to know how to start searching for a loved one, there's a chance for recorded information line on 08701 2020 15 and lines are open around the clock. Here's the number again, 08701 2020 15.